Members of the committee, my name is Catherine Gian. I'm the Executive Director of the Civic Alliance to Stop Slavery. I testify in strong support for this measure, um, and I'd like to highlight some significant um, realities with regard to the reason why this bill is in existence and, and actually also what it will accomplish. Um, I'd like to also highlight the fact that there is no uh, required request of funding from the state in this bill. Um, further, this bill is in response to some city measures and some state measures that have currently um, been flowing through the House uh, with regard to criminalizing the homeless, or I'd like to refer to them as the houseless. Now, there are some very important things to understand when we criminalize a nonviolent community of people, such as the houseless. One, we end up wasting taxpayer dollars in these criminalizing measures. Uh, moving homeless people, or houseless people, from one district to another to get them out of sight during election periods does not either focus holistically on adequately addressing um, the houseless, but it also uh, does not affect public safety at all. Other cities across the nation have done these types of measures which have effectively eroded the civil rights of a, a vulnerable population of other people, our neighbors who are in poverty, such as, I'm just going to focus on one city, San Francisco, which spent $9.8 million from the years 2004 to 2008 on adjudicating and incarcerating the houses and it had no effect on the Once these houses people were released, they went back to the streets, and the whole cycle started over again. And you see this played out on our city streets, on the um, city officials accompanied by HPD, sweeping the streets of houses at the expense of the tax dollar. Now within about um, uh, several weeks, the mayor, in my testimony, had provided link, himself said that he spent $330,000 in that a little span of time on these sweeps, and he's increased the sweeps to three a week. This is not improving the situation, it's only burdening our taxpayers, and then that burden is then switched on the state, and having to deal with not only the increase in incarcerations and the waste of taxpayer dollars, but also the problem of what are we going to do about the houses in the first place. Will this bill solve hol um, holistically the, the issue of houselessness? No. But it is a step in the right direction because it will restore the civil rights that have been eroded in the first place. And once we establish this, and this becomes a law of the land, we can take steps to repair what has been damaged. Um, one of the other things I would like to point out that is very important to understand is that with laws that criminalize a class of nonviolent people, the public responds accordingly. And you see a dehumanization of this class. We've seen it with the Nuremberg laws of the past and with regard to Nazi Germany. And you see it today. Within six weeks, there were three murders of houseless people. And these types of abuses by, by the community, general members of the community, thinking that it's OK to beat up and even kill people who are poor, because no one, obviously, will protect them. And even the police want them in jail in the first place. That's not the kind of state that we want to, to promote, and that's not what Hawaii is all about. So I urge you, kindly and respectfully, good lawmakers, to support and pass this bill. Thank you very much.
that is surrounding houselessness. And the reason for that, from you know, I think that we should all be able to see is that what is going on right now is not working. And what is not working right now is that you know millions, literally of taxpayer dollars are being spent on enforcement efforts, you know, with the emphasis on enforcement that simply do not work. Um, I think that the, the value of this measure is that by protecting human rights first, by establishing that as a baseline from which everyone acts, you know, with no compromise of those rights, it makes us look at real solutions, real things that can work. And I think that is very, very important in relieving the frustration that comes from continually engaging in things that don't work due to pressure. You know, government um, are pressured by their constituents. The government then pressures the police and city workers who then, um, you know, who then will carry out abusive behaviors, quite frankly, um, many of them are really pretty bad out there. And um, I believe that this is a result of the fact that we don't, at this point, have consensus on the protection of human rights, first and foremost. Um, and so I believe that if we are to go back to the Kanawai Mamalahoi, the law of the splinter paddle, upon which all um, laws in Hawaii are, are founded, then we will see that there is, there is precedent, you know, and it's one that has been recognized in the United Nations and many, many other places to protect human rights first and then build solutions from that, you know. We may not know what exactly those solutions are going to look like, but we know in which forum they need to exist. So I please ask you to please support this, this measure. It may seem like, um, you know, it, it may seem like a, a small thing, um, but it's very, very, very important. Thank you very much. Mahalo. Okay, thank you. Anyone else wish to testify? Well, hello. My name is H. Uh, Doug Matsuoka. I'm with a group called Hawaii Guerrilla Video Hui. And um, I submitted testimony. I don't want to repeat it. Um, I did want to show you what I use, and that's a little uh, device like that. And I've used a device like that to document uh, many raids. For instance, right now, this is being broadcast directly onto the internet. And, and you don't need much. And I've been able to document a lot of the raids. In fact, I've logged uh, 97 raids just in the Thomas Square area. And I don't know how it is in the other counties, but in Honolulu County, in the, in the urban part of the city, um, city and county crews have come with a convoy of trucks with uh, dozens of uh, armed police, stop at a camp, throw everything in garbage uh, trucks, in bins, um, and um, keep, the, keep the people away using the police. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm assuming it's the same way in some of the other counties. So I'm in, very much in support of 1889. I know there's a finance committee. I don't know as far as, as the costs involved, uh, what it entails. I once uh, was in a program that was taught by Dean Ward on entrepreneurship. And uh, I learned much, but you can apply entrepreneurship um, toward things that are not necessarily monetary, toward, uh, toward community things, toward uh, justice goals, which is what I'm hoping to do with the small amount of uh, capital that I have. Um, and I'm also here to answer questions if you, if you want to uh, ask one. Well, that concludes my testimony. Great, thank you. Anyone else who should testify? Members, any questions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have as much hair on his face. No, no, and it was a lot darker. Uh, Ms. Teal mentioned that everybody's frustrated, one, two, three, four, and she didn't mention the legislators because some legislators are even calling upon the dead. I'm calling on Frank Fazi, probably who would have had a solution. It may not have been legal. But <laughs> we 
have really done nothing else. And my question is really this. Well, two questions, actually. First, let's go to uh, uh, Marcia's question. Why do we have 2050 as the implementation time? That system? actually, I know the answer. You, you, could you give it? Because well, it's, it's very common on, on bills to put a, I think it's called a defect date or a defective date, and that puts it far enough in the future so that it's a signal that, that it's going to continue to, to go on and be discussed. And once the final is set, they'll put a closer, reasonable date in. I believe that's correct. Is that's that correct. True? So it's sort of like buying time for dialogue. It doesn't mean it's a sure shot, but it's, it's a, a, that's, that's a, a very good answer. Uh, but in terms of this bill, could you interpret this in a cynical way that this is sad for the conscience of people who haven't done anything and given the money, and so we've done something nice, warm, and fuzzy, but hey, in terms of housing first, or I think we'll give you a couple of dimes and nickels. Yeah, and I, think, good about it. I think there's a danger on passing it and people patting themselves on the back and saying, hey, we've done something for the homeless. Yeah. But on the other hand, I think it will help uh, not only homeless people, but the, their allies, people like me and the people that have spoken, to allow us to press the case a little bit more, to get count the city and county governments to just back up a little bit, and instead of criminalizing <laughs> homelessness, to, to put more energy into things like housing first and, and that sort of thing. Which is my last question. And maybe it's not particularly you that would be able to answer it. If there was the AG here or somebody who said, would you be able to interpret this to where you can no longer do those raids, you can no longer do certain things? Because it doesn't, it's got more aspirational language rather than specific thou shalt not kind of things. Right. Do you think that this would stand up in, in an implementation fashion? Well, you know, the homeless already, they already have First Amendment rights to peaceable yeah. assembly, they have Fourth Amendment rights to right. Right. security, of, they have Fifth Amendment right to due process, they have Fourteenth Amendment right to equal justice under the law. So will this added uh, measure guarantee that? Probably not, but it it pushes it a little bit more in that direction. It indicates that the state government is 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 behind that, you know. So I think it's it'll be very helpful, and it'll be as helpful as the allies want to make it. Also, you know, it's it's dependent not so much on the government but on the people doing something. Because of that. Thank you for your testimony and showing that entrepreneurship can be political. <laughs> and social. Thank you for your lessons. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, upon reading this measure, who would have to implement this? I think what you're getting at, and what well, this is responsive, is that the appears that the bill sets out a policy statement. It's a bill of rights, but it doesn't include an enforcement uh, we, we have done an initial look at some other states that have uh, enacted homeless bill of rights, and two that we found in Rhode Island and Illinois, and both of them uh, put in a provision for enforcement by private cause of action. So they made the rights enforceable by going to court. And that's, that's not... The so there's, there's no enforcement. So if there's no enforcement, then who would protect their rights if this was passed? I, I wouldn't want to guess. I, 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 in those other states, if there was a specific, because it would be, it's a statutory right, and so the uh, remedy or the forum would be statutory. There may be ways for creative attorneys to, to use a statutory right to uh, uh, express enforcement. So, uh, um, so, in reading these different items in here, is there already mechanisms in our current laws that protect individuals? Well, you know, the there, there were some questions in the earlier committee about the uh, the one protection against discrimination in, or uh, the right to have equal opportunities for employment. And uh, it, one thing that 
uh, and he recognizes that there is an overlap between uh, the people who would be protected, the homeless persons protected under this legislation, and some existing uh, uh, protected bases under our current statute. Uh, I think that when I looked at a couple of the other states, the, the protections are much more specific. So rather than just saying have equal opportunities for employment, the Rhode Island and Illinois laws both specifically say that in, in employment, that uh, no applicant would be discriminated against because they don't have a permanent address. So I think that you could put your finger on because. Uh, the, uh, the thing is, this bill incorporates a definition from 346-361. It's kind of difficult to see how an employee will know all of those things about a an applicant and the face of the funding decision. There may, and again, there may be an overlap of different cases. So, it's good. so um, in here it also says receive emergency medical care. I mean, currently, Anybody walks into an emergency service, well, they're supposed to get medical care, correct? We can't refuse, we can't. right? I mean, they shouldn't be refusing. Yeah, it's, it's directly under I mean, our, our jurisdiction. I know the question came up, our hospital spaces of public accommodation. And the answer to that is yes. So I think that there are, there are also other uh, laws that, uh, in terms of hospitals that receive federal funding or there, there may be uh, other obligations to, uh, to provide services. Because under our public accommodations law, the only things that are, are protected against are discrimin is discrimination. So someone being refused service because of their race, sex, and social religion or other protected places. Classes, right, and public accommodations. Yes. Correct? Yes. So, I think one of my main questions is, is I don't feel it's appropriate to assume somebody is homeless or not homeless. So, how how am I going to be able to apply this to an individual when I shouldn't even be making an assumption that a, a, a person may be homeless or houseless? So, I, I don't see how you can even apply this. And, and you know. This, this is a uh, protection is different in kind from uh, some, most of our other protections because it is it's, uh, class based, economic class based, and uh, we really don't have protections against discrimination based on poverty. Okay. Um, so, what about the you know, Back in the 70s, uh, the courts rejected equal protection arguments. This, is, this really is groundbreaking, uh, um, groundbreaking uh, concept. It's, it's something new and different. It's not the first time it's been tried. It's the first time it's, it has this kind of again, uh, traction in a long time in communities. And again, I, I think because uh, the bill makes reference back to the definition from 246, 360, HRS, 361, it, it does beg the question that you're asking how would, person, how would anyone know that a person is protected or is a member of this protected class? And you know, in public accommodations, and that's actually not the subject of this bill, but it's of another bill. I think uh, it would be based more on perception of being regarded as being someone who's homeless. Because there's no way that a shopkeeper or a coffee shop would know that for certain old person didn't have a place to have. Just keep going. Okay, thank you. Members, any other questions?
Okay, thank you, Sila. Let's move on to House Bill 2264.